Hello and welcome to Beecraft Live again. Uh, apologies for the the outage last month. Um, we had some some issues, so uh, we're back this month with a, a special Q and A session. So we're joined by Kevin and our deputy editor Richard Rickett, who will be back shortly. He's experiencing some technical problems at the moment. Uh, so tonight's topic is, is is going to be purely a question and answer session. We can catch up on some of the backlogs of questions that we haven't got around to previously. And if you have any questions during the event, if you're watching on the Beecraft website, just scroll down, click on the ask a question dialog box, type in your question and that'll come through to us and we can ask it to the panel. So do you wanna give some introductions about yourself, Kevin? How, was, how have things been in France lately? We haven't seen you for a while. Um, mm, certainly. Good evening, everybody, and uh, from sunny France. Sunny this week, certainly. I think the weather has been as unpredictable and changeable here as it has been in the UK, uh, and it's it's impacted our bees and our beekeeping and those of our friends and colleagues just as much as, as I dare say it has for you guys. And we'll share some of some of what's happened here soon. We um, are keeping somewhere oh, we get eight nine hives at the minute which is a manageable level for us here in the Chiron, which is southwest france just and we are looking forward to the sunshine we now have staying for a little bit longer than it's been here for a while pretty much the same year actually we've had atrocious weather for the last couple of weeks well the last two weeks thinking about it um probably had a few days now of well, I wouldn't say it's good weather, but certainly average weather. Mm. So, what are the colonies looking like? Your end, are they are they strong and healthy, or they are? Um, they're a mi it's a mixed bag. We had a couple of weaker colonies going th that we got through the winter. One of which we were surprised actually to get through the winter at all. Um, but it was a it was a a colony which we'd requeened in twenty eighteen with a, a carniolan queen um a species known for its durability and, and and its work ethic its productivity and so we had hoped by requeening with her that we would give ourselves the best chance for a fast and healthy spring build up didn't turn out that way and lo and behold about two weeks later that uh, two weeks ago the rest of the colony came to the same conclusion that we had and started to supersede her no, oh, really. Mm. So that that one's about four or five months later in terms of getting going. The rest, um, all good. Swarming happened in a concentrated window this year, uh, as it did a couple of years ago when we had uh, a winter that wasn't cold enough to reduce colony numbers down. So they were stronger than they should have been when the spring rains came and the spring rains didn't last two weeks, they lasted five weeks. So what would have been six or seven weeks worth of swarming behavior and hopefully proactive management and control by us turned into, we knew it would happen, so at least we were ready for it, but turned into six days of all hell breaking loose um, at the first extended period of dry weather and sunshine. It's almost been exactly the same here, to be honest. Yeah, it really has, you know, it's exactly what I've experienced in South Wales. How about yourself, Richard? How, how's it looking in your area? What are the, the hives looking like? Uh, they're very precarious at the moment, actually, because uh, we've had a very uh, noticeable and extended June gap this year. It's the first time, actually, that I have to say that it's caused me um, real concerns. I've been having to feed some of the um, smaller uh, colonies um, and uh, I've left on supers um, where I would normally have taken them off um, with the, um, the spring flow. Um, the bees did very well in the beginning of the spring um, and they built up very um, substantially and I was very happy with them. Um, and then we had the, the usual kind of dance we have with sunshine and rain and the oilseed rape and the bees getting out and being trapped in and so forth. Um, but it came good in the end. We had two weeks of good weather and um, the oilseed rape came in and um, lots of interesting nectar from um, I think hawthorn and um, various other trees. So then in fact our spring honey crop, which was quite substantial in the end, um, was very nice honey. Really? Um, Good. Yeah. My spring yeah. honey crop is non-existent to be oh, honest. I probably had an average of 60 to 70 pounds um, 
which isn't bad at all, considering that at least half of the time that the all seed rate was flowering, the bees weren't getting out. Um, but when they did, they, they made up for it and the trees all came out at the same time. Um, but then we went crashing into June. Um, and in fact, before I managed to get all of the crop off, it got very cold and wet and some of the crop didn't come off at all. And in fact, I ended up taking supers in the rain uh, off um, colonies and redistributing to some that had already taken the spring honey crop off because I was worried about them. Um, mm. And I'm just doing the last of the extracting now. But um, I'm having to um, keep a careful eye on them. Just in the last two days, I would say there are signs now of um, where well, the brambles flowering now. And it's been flowering for a couple of weeks, but it hasn't really made any difference. But it seems to, I think it's suddenly giving nectar now. I don't know if it's because of the rain and the fact it's still a bit warmer. Um, I mean, telltale signs, I always think, are around the house. If I have any equipment or frames in boxes or anything with any, any hint of honey, um, if there isn't the flow and the bees are struggling, then you, you'll see the bees seeking it out. You know, any old equipment or what have you, they'll be nosing around trying to get in and find something. And for the last week or so, there have been bees all around the house um, looking for for honey. And the last couple of days, well, yes, yeah, since yesterday, in fact, I, I've suddenly noticed a marked decrease in the number of bees floating around. So I think they're now at last finding something out and about. On the other hand, I was reading on the Beecraft Facebook yesterday, somebody who's not far from me, about 20 miles on the edge of Salisbury Plain, and they said they've had a very good flow for the last couple of weeks. Really? Uh, which I imagine is from whatever's growing on Salisbury Plain. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, certainly been quite variable across the country in terms of you know, the weather pattern. So, yeah, oh. interesting. Right, shall we delve into our questions then? And put some pressure on the panel now we've got a selection of random questions so it's uh, the topics are all over the place really so this is one from a, a couple of weeks ago actually off henry casement now he's asked us where can he get a nucleus of bees from and what should he expect to pay uh, he's had a suggestion of 225 pounds for a nuclear in his county and start with yourself richard from a, a uk perspective what, what's the going rate uh, for nucleus colonies are run by you um i think it, it depends entirely on whether or not you go to a commercial supplier or somebody locally commercial suppliers are always going to be um a bit more expensive i haven't actually looked at the rates recently but i would say something like 200 to 220 is probably about right it depends when you get it and whether or not you're having an overwintered queen that will always be more expensive of course that wouldn't necessarily be the case this late on in the season locally if you were to buy one from a local beekeeper and they've got good locally um adapted bees which i would always recommend over over getting a, a queen that's been bought in from elsewhere um the prices seem to be about 150 to 180 if you're buying one from a local um a local beekeeper and the price will vary, of course, on the number of frames and the size of the frames. Um, and also, um, uh, sorry, somebody just walked in. Uh, uh, also, um, you can't see uh, anyway, so it doesn't matter. Of course, <laughs> uh, the size of the frames and also, um, I completely lost my thread. Uh, number of number of frames um, and also the the, the box. If you buy um, if you buy it from a dealer or from anybody else, they may supply it in something like a Corex box which will be quite cheap. On the other hand, if you get it in a poly nuke or a, or a wooden or plywood nuke and you want to keep that nuke then uh, nuke box, then um, that's going to cost you a little bit more. Mm. So very often beginner beekeepers might have their bees delivered to them in, in, a, in a box from the local beekeeper. And then once they've gone into the hive, um, that box may perhaps be, be taken back. Although, of course, it's always useful, especially if you're a beginner beekeeper and you've only got one colony to, to have a nuke or something, a nuke box or something um, to hand for when you want to split them or they um, decide to swarm on you. I've seen in, in my sort of area in South Wales, it tends to range between probably 150 to 200 pound. Um, and they, they t a lot of the sort of local beekeepers tend to um, offer sort of deposit scheme almost where you can uh, purchase the poly nuke if you want it as well. So how, how about yourself, Kevin, from a French perspective, that'd be quite interesting to see yeah it's it's one of one of the pleasurable facets of, of life here is that beekeeping is a bit cheaper overall so for us 
there's, there are various sources of, of colonies of bees. Uh, a, a nuke, for example, or a rouchette, as it's called here, would would cost you from a, a reputable beekeeper, including the including the the nuke, um, would cost you anywhere between one hundred and fifty and two hundred euros, dependent on when in the year you buy. They assume that if you um, buy earlier on in the year, so for for us that's end of April, early May. They assume if you're picking up colonies then that you're going to get some honey flow, you're going to get some return. So the price is actually higher in the, for spring delivery or spring collection. Um, but you can, because of that, we're lucky to have slightly warmer weather for longer. Um, you can still buy colonies of bees and indeed mated queens. Or colonies of bees, the latest we know of people selling them is August. And you can buy mated queens right through till early October. And they and, and so the there are there there are other ways. So a friendly beekeeper who is just collecting swarms might let you have one of those for fifty euros as long as you return the box once it's been transported. And then there are some uh, guarantee species providers who will artificially inseminate queens and grow colonies almost in laboratory conditions. And you can spend up to 450 to 500 euros for those. The queens on their own are nearly 200 euros if you want the species guarantee that goes with. Mm. And then there, there are friendly beekeepers or some not so friendly beekeepers in between charging charging um, all sorts of things. And it was, I was going to ask actually if you guys had seen, um, pursuant to this, this gentleman's question. Have you seen any, I can't think of another nicer word to use, but profiteering due to extra colony, colony losses that, that maybe are, are growing along at a higher rate than previously? Because we certainly have. I've seen profiteering from a, a swarm collection point of view. Yeah. Um, is it, yeah, is I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't, you know, I, I've never heard of anybody being charged for a swarm other than some sort of gratuity to cover the cost of um you know transport and beekeepers time and what have you and i, I think it would be un unusual and unreasonable to expect to pay actually just for a swarm particularly if it's somebody in your local association um but i don't know about the other issue you mentioned there kevin about people uh, charging more presumably because there's a, a need for for nukes after colony losses in the winter yeah, that's that's that's. Pre I, I won't share with you the exact quote because it has too many expletives in it. But but it, it, yeah, there, there, there's definitely that kind of activity uh, mm. here. Unfortunately, not always driven by locals, mostly by immigrant beekeepers like like ourselves. But chanting around because they can. Mm. I think I recall a question maybe a few years back when we had a particularly wet summer, and then the following year similar question on the cost of nucleus is raised and i'm sure the, the the sort of average price is much higher then so whether that's reflective that type of thing oh, yeah. i mean my, my main advice would be i think to be a member of your local association and to ask around and see who reputable beekeeper, beekeepers, beekeepers are and who can be trusted um because it's like anything unfortunately there are people who will take advantage there's one or two beekeepers in my area who we all now know are a bit roguish and we'll steer people away from them um from experience um so yeah ask around and um you know nobody that you buy a nuke from, from should be shy about allowing you to go and look at their bees and look at the nuke before you you collect it or, or they deliver it to you yeah, absolutely do they still deliver bees uh, is, is is home delivery still prevalent in the uk or is it switching to more of a collection only model there are people who deliver and particularly of course um package bees which um yeah. i think probably is not common among um hobbyist beekeepers but it it can it can happen there are one two supplies of those and they, they will be delivered they can be delivered um, you know, by courier um, i'm not sure about nukes themselves i think they're normally for deliver uh, you know for you to collect yourself that might perhaps be because of conditions um, imposed by the couriers and yeah. I personally I personally wouldn't want to have a courier uh, carry a nuke to me quite frankly no you're some horror stories I'd rather 
correct, I think. But yeah, <laughs> I got a, a nice question now for you, Richard. Um, since you're our resident oilseed rape expert, um, so oh. from e. Moncaster, and he's asked us what's the best way to cream oilseed rape honey. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> um, there are a number of different approaches. One thing that you can do um, is once you harvest the honey and you've got it in buckets, you can cream it there and then. Um, different varieties seem to set hard at, at different rates. So some of it will set as it's you know actually in the extractor. I have had it sitting in the bottom of the extractor going, going hard in there. Um, but that hasn't happened for a couple of years with me. Um, so what I will normally do is I'll set aside a few buckets and um, without putting them away in the garage where I store the rest of it, I will um, leave it in the house. And a couple of times a day, um, I've got one of those honey creaming um, tools. It's a handheld one, uh, which you just plunge up and down. And if you do that a couple of times a day, um, after, immediately after extraction, it will, it will set, but it will stay uh, creamy. So what you're doing is as the crystals are forming, you are agitating them and preventing them from locking together and setting hard. So if you've if you've got the time and inclination to do that, you can actually cream all your buckets of oilseed rape um, when you first extract them, and then you won't have the problem later on. Mm -hmm. um, however, if you've got buckets of solidified um, oilseed rape honey, say much later in the year, um, the way to do it is to um, uh, well, there are different ways, again, of doing it. Uh, oilseed rape has a nice fine grain, so you can uh, you can put it in a warmer until it sort of softens and it's sort of got a creamy texture. Um, and once it reaches that, then you can do the same thing that I mentioned. So you've softened it up, and then you, so you don't need to add anything to it in order to um, uh, introduce a crystal, because oilseed rape always, already has very nice fine crystals. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to add a ready set um seed honey to it it's just a case of um melting the honey down until it's um not liquid but just um as i said a sort of creamy texture um, and then agitating it with one of those paddles um several times over several days um so that it doesn't again set nice and hard it's one of those difficult substances to deal with isn't it do you have much experience with it kevin in france and there, there, there is a lot of rapeseed here and, and a big spring harvest here, but where, we, but not within 15 kilometers of where we live. So we miss out on a spring harvest, but I don't, I'll be honest, I do not miss out on leaving frames of ra uh, rapeseed honey too long, forgetting that they were there and then having to use a screwdriver to get the stuff out. It's, uh, it, it's something, <laughs> something that I don't miss, as nice as it is. <laughs> Can, right. I just, um, can I just give you one one idea for small quantities of oilseed rape? I know people that do do this just for producing eight or ten jars at a time, which is just to um, get the um, oilseed rape out of the bucket or whatever you've got it in, and you need, usually need, need to use a strong knife um, to sort of cut it out in chunks, then pop it in a glass Pyrex bowl and put it into an oven at a very low temperature, so the, as low as your oven will go. Some do go down to about 40, but most of them are more up you know usually about 50 um and then again just soften it up so you'll get it to the point where the honey around the outside is starting to liquidize but the honey in the center is still uh, is is softer but still some, there's a sort of ball of it that's fairly firm um and then what you can do is you can pop that bowl if you've got a magi mix or a um, some sort of kitchen aid or kitchen mixer with a, a balloon whisk on you can then put the bowl underneath that and you can give it a good stir in there at a slow speed you don't want to be introducing lots and lots of air um, and then you can pour it straight from there into jars um, and you'll find that it will it will set but hopefully stay relatively soft yeah just on that thread we, we we've um used uh, stronger versions of the homemade ice cream makers before for that oh. set at a very low speed with robust paddles in they turn at just just a sufficiently gentle speed and rhythm that they they can work through that honey quite comfortably yeah it's just that sort of agitation effect isn't it to stop yeah. those, those locking as you as you said yeah so. 
Right, another another random question from the selection. Um, we've had two weeks of cold, wet weather. So uh, assuming this is a UK question, um, I have low stores. Um, how and when should I supplement the hive with feed? Do I need to feed a pollen substitute? And what is the best sugar water water ratio to use? Who wants to go with that one? Do you want to go first, Kevin? <laughs> Thank you. There, there, there's a, there's a, without wanting to say that I'm answering a question with a question, it, it depends on what the time of the year is, the, the state and the health of the colonies overall, and, and what you are trying to do with or for your bees. So right back to the beginning, about two weeks of cold weather with low stores. Now, the... If it, if it were us, and we actually had something quite similar back in, in April, it was unseasonably wet here, so the bees weren't going out. Um, so on a dry day, we would go out and do our colony inspections just to make sure that they had sufficient stores. Now, what constitutes sufficient? Well, that depends if the bees are managing themselves and the colony has turned the queen off lay or not. It's, and so it's, it's this typical beekeeper's need to be a detective as well as a beekeeper and take on board lots of different bits of information. So if this, this, this the, the person who posed the question has looked inside their hives and the queen is on lay and there are brood in all stages and there is no visible sign of stores, then if it were our colonies, we would be feeding. Um, what do we feed at that point? Well, typically we would just we would just feed... Uh, sugar syrup because uh, and we would feed the thicker version which is the, the popular version here in France because we want it um, for for instant gratification instant nutrition rather than to encourage them to draw out any comb that's not their issue their issue is is being able to sustain themselves um, would we bother with pollen we wouldn't but that's because even when it's it's wet and cold here, there are more flowers producing pollen than there are producing both pollen and nectar. So it's not necessarily an issue that, that we would have to deal with head on. But that said, we have been known in very, very desperate times to take uh, a candy. There is a, a fondant feed, a solid feed called um, candy pollen here. And, and it actually has pollen mixed in with it. So we have been known to water some of that down to make it a softer paste and, and make it a bit more easy, easy to digest and add that as an emergency measure if the bees haven't been able to get out for a really extended length of time and they've got brood to raise. Mm. How about yourself, Richard? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd agree entirely, actually, with what Kevin said. Um, I wouldn't worry probably about pollen. But it's never been uh, a concern for me. Um, but I will go around at the moment, I'm going around on a colony by colony basis, assessing whether or not I think they need some sort of boost. Um, as Kevin said, if there is a lot of brood in there, but very little by way of stores, then that's something that's going to cause me concern. I will feed them a thick syrup. So that's uh, white sugar mixed with a kilo of sugar to about 600 ml of water. Use a fairly thick syrup. Um, and sometimes I will actually use um, fondant. Which is something they'll consume straight away as opposed to opposed to storing at this time of year it's not really an issue whether or not they start storing sugar syrup because none of the colon none of the colonies have got supers on them at the moment anyway uh, since extracting um apart from one or two that i've um put a super with some frames of food back in but in which case i wouldn't be feeding them mm. something i noticed actually the, the the little bit of spring honey i managed to extract when I place the wet supers back on the colony, they they seem to move up into it quicker than they ordinarily would. They, you know, they were instantly on the wet frames. Yeah. So whether that's an indication of you know they were a little short of food, but I think so. I I, I have found that um, uh, in some years, if I put um, supers on a colony after extracting in the spring and it's got oilseed rape in it, which is starting to crystallize, they if they don't. If they're not really hungry, they would don't, they won't always clean it all out and dry it up and make it into nice new comb again before beginning to store in it. Um, this year, where I've put um, supers back on, they've cleaned every last scrap out and it's lovely new uh, clean wax um, ready to be filled. So I don't have to worry. I have to say I've never actually 
it found that my sun, summer crop seems to be setting as a result of leftover oilseed rape. Um, but certainly this year, that won't be an, an issue because they've absolutely mm. cleaned every last sell out. That was something I was going to ask you, actually. D does it act as a seed? Um, have, you, have you found that? Have you heard of some people where they, you know, scrape the, uh, the wax back to the, the middle membrane in order to get every last gram of oilseed rape honey out to, to well, prevent exactly that? So. Normally, I extract my oilseed rape well before it, while it's still warm and well before it begins to set. And then you'll just end up with a bit of unset honey on the supers, which they'll lick up and clean. And, and within it, you can go back within a few days and it's lovely and dry and it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if I've got a lot of frames um, and it's got some um, oilseed rape crystallizing in it, um, I will, in fact, soak those frames. So I use plastic um, storage boxes. I'll soak the frames in water for a couple of days. The crystallized honey will um, absorb the water and then it goes in the extractor and I spin out all the water um, and then dry the frames off and then they're ready to go again and there's, there's no worry from uh, crystallization. That's quite clever. I've never thought of that, actually. Yeah. I remember that one. So, uh, right. Um, oh, on to uh, swamp. Um, I've caught several swarms over the last few weeks. Uh, what is the best varroa treatment for swarms? And what is the best varroa treatment for this time of year? Presumably treating for varroa when there's a, a honey crop on. Uh, do you want to have a go with that one, Richard? I think you've answered um, that. Yeah, well, if, you, if you've caught a swarm, um, then any varroa that are going to be on the bees is, of course, is going to be on the bees. It's going to be what we call phoretic, phoretic stage. Um, and none of it will be um, in any hiding away in any cap cells. So it's quite easy, therefore, to treat with um, oxalic acid. Um, if you've got a vaporizer, you can use that. If not, the more common method is to trickle oxalic acid. Um, one of the oxalic acid um, products that you can buy, mix it with some sugar syrup and just um, trickle five mil per seam on the bees. So what I do is I'll put the swarm into um, a nucleus box with um, uh, some undrawn uh, foundation. And then I usually give them um, a couple of weeks which, is, which will give them a chance to begin drawing out the foundation, but not enough time for the queen to um, usually lay substantial numbers of eggs and certainly not enough time for any brood to be capped. And, and, but I'll, I'll know by then that the bees have settled down and they're not, not likely to have sconed on me or anything like that. And then I will um, trickle five mil of oxalic acid over the seams um, and that should sort out um, any row that you've got in there. If you've got a large colony or a colony that's likely to have honey supers on, um, then of course, um, your options are limited. You can't really use any of the um, thymol based um, treatments and most of the um, uh, uh, synthetic chemical treatments have a withdrawal period or a period where you can't use them if you've got supers on, in which case I think the only options in the honey production uh, period are um, uh, OxyB, which is um, a uh, um, it's a sort of oxalic acid and um, formic acid solution, which you can trickle over the bees, and that's actually very effective. Um, Similar to the, the Mitoway quick strips, is it? The well, yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I'm sure as, as clearly other brands are available, but yeah. uh, we, we dropped the name in, but yeah, the, the formic acid mix, Mitoway quick strips or, or MAQS Max yeah. are, are, are the ones that that we would tend to use if if we either find ourselves in possession of a swarm, well, actually, no, not for a swarm, because, well, I'll come back to it, but it's quite expensive. But if you find yourself needing to treat when there is a honey flow on, I think Max are, are one of the few, if not still the only fully certified treatment um, that will they guarantee it won't tank the honey flow. Yeah. I'm happy to be corrected on that. But yeah. um, that's the formic acid one. The, the, the name I was trying to think of, sorry, just a second ago, is, is Varro, yeah. um, which is one that you can, which is a formic acid and oxalic acid trickle. Yeah. And that's very effective at knocking down um, um, mites. And then, as Kevin was saying, um, Max strips, which is a formic acid treatment, which um, did have some issues a few years ago, I believe, um, but it's been reformulated and people that I know that have used it have been quite, quite happy with it. Yeah, and we, we've, we've been quite happy. We've, we've used it once because uh, we, we keep a, a store as, um, as, an, as, you know, as, almost as an emergency if, if our 
uh, might count drops, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, might drop count dictates we should use it, we keep it. Um, the only issue we found with it was when we tried to use it for the first time here and actually read in detail the usage instructions, we realized that the ambient temperature here was too high for it to work because it alone, it, it's only effective, it's up to about 28, 28 and a half degrees C. And in, a, in last year in the summer, it was way, it was way beyond that. And um, the, the risk is that if you use it above this temperature, it will kill queens. We thought, oh, okay, maybe not then. But I have to say, they're awfully pungent, um, so I'm glad to hear they've reformulated them. Uh, it takes your breath away when you open the box. It really does, yeah. And and, and it has the same effect on the bees. Often you, you will put it on. I have to say I've only used it a couple of times, but from having seen it on other people's colonies, they, you will get be bearding quite often. The bees will all come tumbling out of the front while they get used to it. Yes. Um, I, I, think, I think the temperature... They, they, I think it's between 10 and about, as you said, 28 or 29 degrees. But they, they say only on the day of application. I don't really know what that means. But because, of course, if it's a seven, I think it's a seven day it is, yeah. treatment. So, I mean, you can put it on one day and you, your, your temperatures could vary wildly in the subsequent days. They must be pretty harsh. I remember putting them on and when you place it on top of the brood chamber, you can see the bees disperse. Mm straight away yeah. yeah and and they and it does affect that in our experience it affects the temperament quite quite significantly and um, specifically to, just to, to add to what richard said uh, about treating swarms if if we've collected a swarm uh depends on the planet if we plan to nurture it ourselves we we might not actually treat for our until we've observed its strength and observe the, the bees themselves for a little while. If there's if there's plans for it to, to move on to a new home, then we will quite often use a thymol treatment. Um, we use one called Apigard, which is the foil tray. Um, and, and and each each treatment cycle is uh, is two weeks. And you and to get a full treatment cycle, you would normally put two trays in a fortnight each. But obviously, because we 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 only have foretic bees in or bees at fretic stage in a swarm i.e no brood we only run through one fortnight cycle mm. right let's move on to another question now um this one's from a subscriber um each year i use one colony to produce cut comb uh, last year some of it was spoiled by having pollen in it was there a reason for this and is there anything i can do to prevent it this one ties quite nicely into showing honey because I tend to do a little bit of cut comb for showing honey. So what are your thoughts on ways to prevent pollen getting into your cut comb? Any techniques you use? Um, I don't I don't usually produce cut comb, but when pollen does get up into the supers, um, uh, well, some, some bees are more prone to storing um, pollen um, up in the supers. So it may just be that your, your bees are bees that want to do that more. Um, or it can just be that it's the super is directly above the brood nest, in which case they're essentially extending the brood nest up beyond the queen excluder if you've got a queen excluder in there. Um, so it might just be that you, sh if you do it again this year, um, you may put, perhaps put your first super on just with ordinary foundation um, at the beginning of a flow. And then when the flow is really strong and underway, um, which is really the best time to be producing cut comb, then you'll pop your next super on, but make sure it goes above the first, so you're over-supering rather than under-supering, and then I think you're much less likely to um, to get pollen in it. But it sounds, Rodri, as if you're uh, probably better placed to comment on that. Pretty much as you said, to be honest. I, I would tend to start it off on um, un unwired foundation, just above the queen excluder, with a good strong colony with a good honey flow. And as they start to draw it, then I would swap it over, place a drawn super underneath for them to fill up, and then place the, the undrawn or partially, partially drawn frames then above in the second super. And theoretically, they shouldn't place pollen within that top super. As you said, it, they tend to keep it closer to the brood nest. Yeah. Tends to work for me um, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we... um. Uh, they, they, I, th I believe they've stopped manufacturing the the the, the rounds, the casing systems that you used mm -hmm. to get for cut combs. Um, Ross rounds were the ones. Rounds, yeah. yeah, and 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 we understood from the manufacturer they weren't making them anymore. 
but our experience of those and from chatting to other beekeepers that, that used to use them was that they it went in it went in higher supers but even when it was in the first super because we have dedant frames typically uh, hives typically here in france and they're 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 a, a fair way bigger than nationals so if you get two supers that's that's a, a very 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 strong honey flow so there might typically only be one flow very much you get 28 kilos of honey out of one super uh, one dedan super so once those rounds are actually in the frames they tend not to store pollen in them mm. Or oh, maybe we were just really lucky. Yeah, I think there is a bit of luck involved with it. <laughs> there always is. Um, I would tend, if you've never tried doing cut comb, give it a go. It's quite good fun, actually. It is certainly is a challenge, and, yeah. and preparing it for sale is a challenge as well. Have you ever used sections, Audrey? I haven't, no. No, it's something I wanted to try and just never got around to it. There's yeah. a nice product at the moment called Honeycomb 999, I think it is, and you it's a complete kit and you get all the lovely little wooden frames mm. uh, which are sort of clip, a sort of clip together frame um, which will go in your super and then you get the boxes and what have you that you can also sell the comb in once it's full um, mm -hmm. so I've got one of those and I'm intending to try using it once uh, fingers crossed we get a, a good flow this summer or well, once the weather improves so. mm, yeah yeah mm. I think my some of my lime honey which I get a lot of here would go nicely in that yeah. That just is nice, nice comb, nice wax. And a lot of people ask for it, or I'm finding that you know, increasingly they're asking for cut comb honey, which, yeah. which, which is good. And it, it and looks it all the time product yeah. from the hive, doesn't it? You know, it looks like it comes straight from the hive. I think it's got that selling point to it. So there we are. It does. Right. Question from Katie Dello. Um, I have a queen that is now in her fourth year and not yet superseded. Should I leave them to supersede or remove the queen now? Uh, if I remove her, will they make emergency queen cells? Um, if I leave them alone, I'm concerned that the queen's pheromone will reduce and I'll have a laying worker to contend with. What are your thoughts on that? I would say yeah. that four years is, um, is quite old for queen, but if she's still actively producing and laying, um, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. On the other hand, I think it depends on how many colonies the um what's her name katie uh katie, katie yeah. it depends on how many colonies she, she's got if, if you've only got several colonies then it's quite crucial to you that you um you know do your best to to hang on to those colonies into winter the biggest issue i think with an older queen like that is is she going to get through the winter and is she going to produce enough bees in the autumn to see the colony through the winter mm. so one thing that you could do is to yes remove the queen take out a few frames and pop her in the nuke um, and then let her live on in, in, in the nuke um, because um, even if she's still productive she will she will um, probably last longer in a nuke if she's not laying up so many frames but removing her from your existing colony will then induce them to um, produce um, emergency queen cells uh, so uh, within about a week of you taking away the queen providing there are eggs or young larvae in the um, in your main colony uh, emergency cells will be produced some people say just leave them all um, but if it's a very strong colony um, then there's the chance that uh, the first emerging queen could swarm so I always reduce emergency emergency cells down to one um, and see what you get but you'd want to do it relatively soon um, because you don't want to leave it too late in the season because of course any queen that comes out um, has got to get mated and you want to know that she's laying well to produce all those important um, autumn and winter bees for you how about yourself kevin anything to add uh no I was, we were we were surprised and quite envious to see that you, there was a, there was a queen approaching her fourth birthday yeah <laughs> to be to be honest it's uh i agree with exactly with, with what richard said the, the concern is not what she's doing now but what she's going to be doing with the colony in preparation for getting through the winter um, just one small thing to add is that if the winter transpires, uh, it turns into a wet and mild winter, the same as we had before, then there is actually an increased chance that uh, she won't go off late over the winter and it will expedite her demise, um, potentially 
before the beekeeper can get in in the spring to start doing their inspections. And that, that's a problem that's been prevalent here for the last two or three years, not cold enough for long enough. And, but the weather's not been warm enough for beekeepers to do their inspections. So this should I, shan't I requeen what, what should happen? Queen goes beautifully strong uh, into the winter, sufficient numbers of bees, sufficient stores. Queen actually not go, doesn't go off late into December, January, cold snap at the end of January. She, go, she dies, um, but it's still not warm enough for another five weeks to open the hive. And by the time be, and we know several beekeepers this has happened to, it's in the local literature as well. Um, they're opening up hives to do a spring inspection to already find drone laying workers because we, we missed the queen dying. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think my inclination would be to, to do as, um, as we say, and, and probably remove the queen sooner rather than later into a nuke. Um, because you'll still have her as a backup. So if you're, if you're queen from an emergency queen cell, doesn't come good you've got your queen old queen um but hopefully your new queen will start laying and be a good strong queen going into winter and then you can allow your old queen to build up a decent colony again in the nuke and then next spring you can pop that that colony into a hive and build it up again with the old queen with the view to you know you, you know the fact that she's an old queen will probably need quite possibly need replacing but she may well build up another colony for you next spring out of interest, what's the oldest queen you've had in France? Three. Three, Three seasons. Three seasons. Mm -hmm. and then, but then Colony wasn't taking sufficient supersedure actions before a winter, so we stepped in and requeened. Mm -hmm. well, what's your thoughts on emergency queen cells? Just out of interest, to be honest, because a lot of people, you know, the traditional view is, you know, emergency queen cells are inferior to a uh, supersedure cell. I don't think there's any merit to it personally, but... I, 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 yeah, I know we, we personally read, read the same literature and, and attended some of the same courses by the sounds of it. Our experience, uh, and those certainly of our beekeeping association, is that the, the only really observable difference between a scrub queen or an emergency queen and, and a healthily superseded one is, is in um, well size, I suppose, most obviously, but, but in lifespan. So that genetically, they are of exactly the same makeup as a superseded queen. Mm. And what they seem to lack is just life expectancy. So the, 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 the nomenclature of, of emergency queen is probably about right. It will get a colony through a rough patch or a short to medium term patch until they're ready to supersede again. I mean, I suppose you'd have to have been a beekeeper for 50 years and keeping very detailed generation to generation records to, to have it much more than anecdotal evidence. But that's our experience. They, they don't live as long, but the colonies are perfectly healthy and they're a great way of the colony managing itself back into a rhythm that it wants to be in. Mm. And any thoughts, Richard? Yeah, I think I'd agree with Kevin there entirely. I, I have to say that um, quite a few of my queens um, each year uh, come about as, as the res result of the emergency requeening process and um, probably more often than not, they're noticeably smaller, but not perhaps by a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never, I have to say, I, w I, I haven't noticed that their lifespan is shorter than any other. Um, queen. I know it's often said that, but my own personal experience is that they 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 last two or th they seem to last two or three seasons, which is probably about average, um, without any real problems. Mm. Uh, but I have noticed that that they are more likely to be superseded. Yeah, but not necessarily particularly quickly. But I'm, they are more likely to ev eventually be replaced through supersedure. I've got a, a question from myself now, actually. <laughs> um, Something I've never seen before. Um, it was a couple of weeks ago when we had our last sort of warm spell and I inspected one colony. I was marking the queen and I was a bit overzealous, pressed the cage on her too much and stunned her. Took the cage off and she was left sort of paralyzed on on, on the frame. How would you deal with a, a stunned queen? They were an open question to both of you. Yeah. <laughs> Personally, I would just close up the hive and see what happens the next time you come back 
I, I would expect either for everything to be normal. So look for eggs and then look for the queen. Or you might find emergency queen cells. Or you might find a supersedure cell if you've perhaps damaged her, but um, you know, not, not too seriously. Mm. I don't think you can do anything more than that. Wait and see. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen Kevin and have you? No, fortunately enough, not never, never to have, have hit one so hard that, that she's been started. Painted them entirely pink once, being a bit overzealous with, with the marking pens. But uh, but yeah, but even when we did that, it was just a wait and see. You'd be very careful about putting her back into the hive because, I mean, I don't know if you lay your frames horizontally to push the cage on a mark. So obviously lifting the cage off gravity will do its thing and we don't want to damage damage or dropping her back into the hive but um maybe a maybe a queen clip would do we've done we've done that with um with just moving swarms around but put a queen that you're a bit concerned about into a queen clip in the bottom mm. of the hive and just leave her for 24 hours there's enough room in there for her to to, to wander around for a few hours with if she's while she's reviving, and the pheromone scent will still be in the hive, so hopefully the the rest of the body won't be too agitated. But I wouldn't leave it in there for any more than half a day a day tops. Well, that's exactly the problem I had. The the frame was horizontal, so I couldn't pick it up to put it back in the hive. In the end, I I, I left her in the sun for about fifteen minutes, and she slowly started to come around. Fab. Um, and I managed to place it back in the hive and all was well. So yeah. And have you been have you been back in that colony since? Yeah, yeah. All all is well. well. Okay, yeah, all good. Well. So it was pure luck, pure fluke. Well, there we are. <laughs> right. Question from Gary Rigby. Uh, last year was my first year of keeping bees, and I have one hive I started late in the season. I overwintered it with two supers. A few weeks ago, I noticed the queen had laid eggs in the first super. So presumably he's taken the queen excluder uh, off when he's overwintered it. Should I remove the supers before winter? And what is the best thing to do with the super frame with eggs in it? Would like to try that one. <laughs> well, from from our from our experience, I mentioned earlier on, we we typically use either worry or dedant hives here. Worry is a bit different, different example because there, there's a different methodology for, for keeping bees in them. But our dedant modular hives are, are of a size that a general rule of thumb is that you would never leave a super on over winter. It's just too much space for the bees to keep heated. Uh, and, and it's almost a guaranteed way to kill an overwintering colony is, is to leave supers on. So fortunately for us, we don't, um, we don't find ourselves in that situation. Again, it depends what the, the, the what Gary wants to do. If he wants a very, very large colony and it seems on inspection to be healthy, well, you could run brood and a half for for the season and, and then so and queen exclude and super up beyond the brood and a half. Or it depends how many frames or how many eggs are there, but or you sacrifice a, the, the the brood that's been laid in the super and clean it out and just just make it a, 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 a normal in quotes super again with the queen excluded between the super and the brood box richard any thoughts yeah no exactly the same i mean i'm in a similar situation um in that i keep all of mine on 14 by 12s um so i've never felt the need to have anything other than that going throughout the winter um I'm not very familiar with using brood and a half. There's a good article about it in this month's um, bee craft, I have to say, by, there Adrian, is. Waring, by Adrian Waring. Um, so that's worth looking at. Um, but in terms of if you're worried about their, depending on what system you're running, but if you're worried about there being brood in the super, it's just a case of popping a um, queen excluder between the super and the brood box, and the um, the brood will emerge and it will go back down into the into the brood box. There may be some drones amongst it, but they will come out when you um, inspect the colony. And then the, the super will gradually be um, turned back into um, a super just full of honey stores, as usual. Um, yeah. You may find, depending on how many generations of, of bees have been raised in that super, that some of the comb is rather dark because it's got the um, uh, it's got the um, the casings, the silk casings still within the um, within the cells. Um, that's not really a particularly a problem for um honey production but i would 
I would tend to, um, at the end of the season, when I've extracted that honey, um, remove those combs and um, replace them for next season. And just to add to that, it links the previous question and this one, and thanks for reminding me, Richard. When, on occasion, if you do end up with a, a, a super frame that has had brood in it previously, if ever we have seen pollen being stored in a super, it's nearly always, in fact, no, not nearly, it's always been in those super frames that are slightly darker because they've had brood in them. And there's got to be something with the storekeeper bees recognising the scent of brood cells, mm -hmm. and that's why they're putting pollen in it. It's the only time we've ever seen it. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I have to say I haven't noticed that, that but I think it, that really does make sense. Yeah. Mm, presumably where they propolize it, uh, yeah, the scent of the brood, they think store pollen. Yeah. Makes sense in theory. That's, yeah. yeah. Uh, right, question on queen rearing from Graham Ashworth. Um, this year we've been trying to raise our own queens, but the weather has been awful. It's a bit of a common theme, I think. Mm -hmm. um, just having the odd spell of sunshine. Uh, if the queen can only get out for short periods to mate, what is the realistic interval between flights for her to get out um, to become fully mated? And how long would it be before she starts laying due to the poor foraging and cold weather? It's quite a difficult question, actually. Do you want to go first, Richard? Um, yes. Well, the, the queens don't actually need very long to mate. Um, they only need something like, well, it probably depends on how far away the that your local during congregation area is or what have you um and some queens can possibly even mate you know within the apiary itself uh, but so long as you have a spell of sort of 30 30 to 45 minutes um on the one occasion that i observed a queen leaving and coming back it was about 45 minutes that she was away mm. um so presuming in, you know, if within that time she's got out and she's found enough drones to mate and she's come back successfully she's got the um mating sign on the back of her um then i don't think it's a problem providing your colony's got enough stores to um to feed her she'll begin laying um you know within a few days so um you know they're they're very resourceful and they'll take advantage of, of quite brief um spells in the weather to um to get out and about and, and to mate i think the thing probably to do is to observe what the drones are doing um if there are periods you know between rain showers and you see drones leaving well then they're leaving for one reason and that's to to go and mate in which case any queens that you've got are likely to be doing the same mm. interestingly during well yet yeah, yesterday when i looked at the hive actually the amount of drones that i could see leaving the hive is unbelievable i've never seen that many before um yeah when i went to um my, one of my apres a couple of days ago actually it was in a brief um it was in the afternoons. We had one of those. It had been raining in the morning, and then we had a very sort of sultry afternoon. With with um, the sun had come out, and it was sort of quite steamy. And I got to my apiary, and I would have sworn that there was a, a swarm in the air. But in fact, it was um, as you said, Rodri. It was just masses of drones leaving. Yeah. I think it was their yeah. first opportunity, and they were all out um, yeah. off to do their job. But exactly the same. Exactly. I could have sworn there was a swarm there. Yeah. Okay. How about yourself, Kevin? Um, any advice? I agree with Richard, just maybe a, a, a couple of, of things to to consider, better be building on what Richard had said. One is if if the, the weather and, and, and some of these other circumstances are, are working against the bees, then maybe we, you could consider mitigating them by, uh, and we've, we've done this ourselves, um, making sure that there is food around um, liquid syrup feed. You can buy tiny feeders to go on to queen re rearing nukes if that's what you're doing, but you can think about providing food, not to encourage mating, but to make sure the bees in the colony are strong enough to make sure the queen is strong enough to get out on her flight when that potentially short window of opportunity presents itself. And the second thing, um, which uh, a friend of ours has done, uh, relatively recently is actually to make sure that what your queen rearing uh, hive boxes wherever you're keeping them are actually in in a close proximity to where you know there are strong and healthy drones so you're actually minimizing the amount of time she's going to be at risk in less than ideal weather by being out on the wing now, i know 
the germ congregation areas aren't always near apiaries, but it doesn't hurt to have a good genetic pool of germs to draw from if your queen's going to maybe have fewer chances to get out and, and do that job than she might ideally. Yeah. I think there are certainly years when queens get, uh, there are problems with, with queens getting mated. So I think not last year, but the year before, certainly in this area, a lot of people complained that queens were failing and not getting mated properly. But um, I mean, who knows what the reason what the reason is, but it, if you think about it, a queen is supposed to be receptive to mating for about a month after she emerges. Now, at this time of year, what are the chances of within a month uh, a queen not being able to find one or two slots of, a, of, of say, an hour in length that she can get out and, and, and mate? It's quite, uh, I would say it was quite rare. <laughs> That's interesting, actually, Richard, that, that we've I'm, I'm glad you said that, and maybe we can catch up offline about that, because there is, um, there's a, a book that we have, um, one of our guests recommended that we have a book, and it, and it suggests that the ideal window for mating for a queen is about seven to nine days. So, so somewhere the, the science is, is, is confusing the picture, so it'd um, be good to have a, a chat and maybe get something in Beecroft just to, just to confirm or, or clear up any confusion. Yeah, I think that's 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 very interesting. I mean, I'm I'm going as many of us do on things that we've we've picked up and read in various books. So it would be interesting to get to the bottom of that science, but because I mean, from an evolutionary point of view, um, that's a pretty risky strategy to have a queen that's only able to mate for a few days, say between seven and nine days. It may be that after that point, um, she is less able to um, store uh, to take in and store um, as many sperm, and so perhaps. After that point, she's still able to make, but perhaps less successfully. Yeah, a diminishing returns mm, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure there is some science on it. We'll have to see what we can dig up. <laughs> Lovely. Well, we've come to the end of tonight's event. It's nine o'clock, and we still it's gone flown by this evening. Yeah, and we still got a raft of questions to go through. So I'll probably save them for another event, actually, and we, we'll have a general catch up. Um, Unless, have you got time for one more, Kevin? Um, yes. Yeah, certainly. This is one for you then, directly, because I know <laughs> you. I know you use B gyms, so yeah. Um, so uh, the question is: uh, just wondering how the UK beekeepers are coping with varroa in 2019. Um, we've been using B gyms for a while now, and the varroa counts are markedly lower than usual. I remember you saying you use B gyms. Uh, so yeah, what, what's your experience of them? Um, sorry, yeah, our, 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 we we are fans, and I have to say that we we are under no obligation to say as much, and and, and are receiving no uh, compensation for saying as much. We we use bee gyms in all of our hives. Uh, every hive has at least one on the floor above the varroa mesh floor and underneath the brood frames. Some uh, following the, the inventor of BGM, if you just look at the, the website, bgm.co.uk, there is there's some new research on that which is suggesting that you can actually put a BGM on top of the brood frame, the brood frames, and improve the results even more. Uh, so we, we're trying that. We're trying that um, with the latest batch that, that we bought for uh, all the people here in our bee association, beekeeping association, use them. And it is bizarrely helping. I give you to, well, it's empirical evidence. We have just done in the last week um, eight hives of mite drop counts. And we have a daily count of in between two and three mites for this time of the year i think the limit is 10 11 something like that and we haven't put chemicals anywhere near them for well over a year you got an experience in the bee gyms richard if i, um, I, I recall, we did an article a few years ago didn't we on them i think I, I i have um i have one which i bought as an experiment and um it's been in one colony for two years and that colony is among the colonies in that particular apiary with the lowest um, mite drop. 
so I can't say that that's what's causing it, but certainly that is a healthy colony with a very low mite drop in an apiary where there are colonies with much higher um, mite drops. Um, I've seen the bees using it. Um, it's interesting how they don't. I, I put it. It's on the. It's on the mesh floor. It's not tropalized. It's not dirty or anything like that. Yeah. Absolutely, it's been in there for two years and looks as if it was put in there yesterday. The one thing I have got and I haven't used because I keep forgetting to take it with me is as well as the. I don't know if all listeners are familiar with them, but the bee gym is just a little plastic, um, uh, plastic frame. Um, it's a sort of um, sort of a number of sort of plastic tubes which are. Um, I think it's in probably injection molded into a framework and it has a number of um, little plastic i think they call them flippers on it and some wire uh, plastic uh, some nylon um wire it looks like a fishing line and yes. the idea is that the bees actually use it a bit like a horse with a scratching post and they use it to preen themselves and scratch off the <coughs> varroa and there is some quite interesting video online of the bees actually doing that um, so there's the large bee gyms which go on the floor or as Kevin was saying that there's some evidence that they might work quite well laid across the top of the frames and they have also produced some little small ones which um, sort of about the size of a pencil sharpener which push into the actual frames as well into the brood frames have you have you used those Kevin no no I haven't seen those no yeah, um, I, I, I must I must try and use them this year and see if that seems to make any difference so I have to say that um, uh, I haven't any scientific proof <laughs> as much as I could produce that, that, that they are a good thing, but certainly the colony that uses it um, is healthy and um, prospering. Mm. And they're not very expensive. I think they're about eight pounds each or something, eight or nine pounds. I, they've, um, they've, this year's price is only because it's top of the head, having recently ordered some. They retail in the UK at 12, 12 pounds 50, something like that, with discounts for bulk buying. So if your bee association or beekeeping association got together, there are some quite attractive discounts available. Oh, lovely. Lovely. Well, that, that is now the end for this evening. Um, I'll save up the, the remaining questions for another event and we'll uh, put it to the panel again. Put the thumb screws on them and get the information. So uh, there's no hangout next month, but our next event then will be the 14th of August um, when we're going to host a special on designing and making labels for cut comb, for uh, honey, etc. And we're going to have a label designer on the event to, to, to pose your questions to. So I hope you can join us on the uh, 14th of August. But bye from me for this evening. Cheerio. Cheerio. Bye. Bye.